I'm just going to start this out with a prayer and say, I pray that you would have understanding of God's will and that you'd be able to hear from his voice. This is probably one of the most important messages I've ever had and that I've given women the last 35 years and I decided to dress up a little, <laughs> even though I'm my own worst critic, to talk about the movie of your life. There is a movie that's being made about my husband's life, but the biggest message of his life is as you've done it to the least of these, so you've done it to me. So if I'm gone from this earth, which I will be, I just pray that this video is one that my grandchildren will see, my grandsons, their grand, their wives, maybe my, my children, their wives. This is the most important message there is because I want to talk about the issues of life that come from the heart. And one thing that just really blows my mind is the fact that I went on, did a Google search to find a $5 an hour script writer to help me write a little script. And I found about 40 movie producers and directors that we had to finally pick one from. And the script is done for the movie of my husband's life. And, and the, one of the most powerful things about that is actually after about 10 hours of this woman who I picked to write the movie of his life, she was able to get one of the deepest messages of watching Gene on video for 10 hours, plus all the other things she saw that um, the bottom line of his life is, is to see into the third heaven of, of God's creation. Because in the first and second heaven, there's only earthly, sensual, devilish wisdom. So she, she was able to perceive that this is a guy that could be killing people with his hands because he's a heavyweight boxing champion that tapped into the third heaven to get God's wisdom in difficult situations. And that really, a movie will come, a movie will go. But we all have a movie being written about our life. The book is being written every day. And really what matters is what we do to the least of these, right? So um, <laughs> when she was, you know, writing writing the screenplay uh, and hear, realizing that Gene hears from God's voice and it's one of the most important things about his life, it actually kept him from being decapitated because he heard God's voice that said, make sure you don't strap your helmet. And when he went into a lake if his helmet would have been strapped he would have lost his head so hearing god's voice has everything to do whether we're going to act out life in the first and second heaven with people or act it out in the third heaven where we grab god's wisdom so i want to talk a little bit about a wise woman and a foolish woman which can really relate to a, a wise man or a foolish man and the bible says a, a wise woman is far better than rubies who can find her and the same thing's true with a man you know where can you find a wise woman a wise woman or a wise man so count yourself lucky if you've ever found somebody that built their house on a sand and great was the floods great was the disaster and they decided to learn how to build their house on a rock instead and because i went through the valley of the shadow of death fearing everything and had to really lay down control and put my trust in the Lord a couple of times. The wind and the rain just about killed uh, me and my children. So I have a story to tell, and I've been telling the same story for about 38 years. It's gotten a little more condensed over the years. So that's actually what I wanna talk about today. I thought about making this in a few short segments, but pretend like you came to a women's meeting and I'm having a women's meeting with you alone. Or if you're my grandchild, my daughter, my daughter-in-law, my granddaughter-in-law, that I'm just talking to you personally because I'm going to make this a little longer, but there's so much value. If you want to understand the issues of life that come from the heart, hang in there for this because that's what people don't understand. And that's why Jesus came. He didn't come to make us feel good. He came to help us understand the issues of life that come from the heart but we have to be in touch with our motive and intention to get there. So I, I did write some notes. I'm gonna be looking at the camera and looking at my notes too, both. So the Bible says, test the spirits. Can we test the spirit? 
of the words that are coming into our, our mind? Where are they coming from? What father is speaking in the heavenlies these words? The father of love? The father of lies? What words are coming out of our mouth? Can we taste them? It matters. It matters. The meditation of our heart, the words of our mouth, the thoughts in our head matter. And again, it's a matter of life and death is what it really is. So <clears throat> the Bible says, test the spirits. And there's only one way to build our house on a rock. It's to be a wise woman. And so we're either going to be plucker downers. The wise woman builds her house. The fool plucks it down. There's only two options. There's not three. So we're either being the wise woman that's building a house because we're getting that wisdom from the third heaven, hearing God's voice, or we're hearing other voices and we're plucking down houses. So um, there's a, a scripture I've been talking about a lot recently and for years, and it's profound. I went by the field of the slothful who didn't judge any spirits, the woman who is void of understanding, who didn't test spirits. What spirit is this? Where is it coming from, right? Where is it taking me? So the Bible says, don't let corrupt communication come out of your mouth because you'll poison yourself and poison other people, right? And so we're either going to have a common union of holiness, what our hands are tasting and touching, or we're going to have... Uh, we're going to be nitpicking people to death out of wrong, the wrong kind of judgment. So uh, when we're a happiness idolater, we're not following peace and holiness with all men. And every day is a new day to overcome the wiles of the devil and be delivered from evil and to get our daily bread. We don't have to travel through life slothful and void of understanding and put a gun on people to fix us and save us and help us because Jesus is too little, right? Uh, so the recipe for a house built on the sand or the rock is getting that wisdom that comes from above. Because every day the Lord is trying to help us get wisdom. Even the heavens declare the glory of God. So God's glory is all around us. God is speaking to us all the time. The only question is, can we hear him talking? So it says about that woman who's a plucker downer, that her heart is filled with thorns, snares, and traps. And even though she might look good on the outside, her heart is an open grave on the inside. And the wise woman isn't out for herself and her pleasure because her heart is set on pleasing God and following peace with men, her husband, you know, other people. So if the Lord isn't helping a woman, it might be because she's a scorner. Because whenever we start scorning children, husbands, people, wife, we're kind of scorning God. Why did you let me help this, to this today? Why did you get off your throne today, right? So scorners don't get anything from the Lord. Um, there's a lot of scriptures on that, too. You should look them up sometime. Scorners reject truth, and they listen to the wrong voices in the first and second heaven. It says, where strife and self-will is, there's earthly, sensual, devilish wisdom. But the God, the wisdom that comes from God will bring you peace, will bring you revelation, will bring you understanding. So um, if you read the, the scripture about scorners, it says they're like tea bags with holes, scorning women. They can't contain any truth, men too, because they don't go after their evil imaginations against the Lord. Nothing you say to a scorner matters. They can't hold on to truth or wisdom. And until a woman, a man sincerely desires about pleasing the Lord and caring about the Lord, like loving the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, you're probably not going to go too far in God's kingdom. So, and um, that sincerity of heart is really everything. And when you're sincerely in love with yourself and idolatry and pleasing yourself to get your own needs met, you're, you become blind. You, you can't see. So only when we become pure of heart do the blinders get taken off of our eyes. A woman who lives for her own pleasure, the Bible says, is dead while she lives. And until we repent and wake up to the kingdom inside of us, we'll blow off God's voice talking to us, right? 
for leaning on our own understanding and pleasing ourselves. That's the fool that's plucking her house down. So a woman who lives for pleasure is dead she, until she repents. She'll just tear people, other, she'll be used by the devil to tear other people down too. And it says, if you don't enter into the kingdom, you'll keep other people from entering in. That's really very true. So um, whether you know what you're doing or you don't know what you're doing really doesn't matter either because you're still doing it one way or the other. So when we're trying to get everybody else to be the great physician to us, our life isn't going to go too well. And we'll put the wrong spirit in our words that end up destroying us and destroying each other. So it's the great phys physician that's our healer, right? He sent his word and healed us and delivered us from our destructions. We have to have value. We have to delight in understanding, delight in God's word. And if we don't, there's something wrong with us, okay? So... Um, when a fool talks, her words tear down, they don't build up. And the sad part about being that kind of woman is you don't even really know when you're doing it, much less do women like that really even care. So I've seen um, a lot of women with dark hearts that were alienated from the life of God due to the ignorance in them. And when your heart is bitter, you're also fearful and unbelieving, and we can't help but defile people. Bitterness is the is the demise of the human soul. So what we're all working through is being bitter. And because the kingdom of God is within us, that's deep too, because God's always giving people everywhere thoughts that are coming from him. The devil is too. Even... There's this place that says that the children of the world are more righteous than the children of the kingdom because they can hear that little inspiration that comes from God and do it. They might not glorify God. They might not even know it's God, but they're still doing that act of kindness, that act of goodness or saying they're sorry or whatever. So sinners can even tap into that sometimes more than miserable Christians can. So... Um, <clears throat> Being sincere again, being the key, the key thing here about staying reconciled to God ourselves so we can be the path of reconciliation to others. Um, let's see here. There's a scripture that talks about being wise in your own conceit. That's really bad too because and I think it says scorners are wise in their own conceit. Fools are wise in their own conceit. And once we walk in the wisdom of our own conceit, there is more hope than a fool. That's what the proverb says. So Proverb 31 says, Who can find a diligent woman? Her, far, her price is far above ruby, rubies. She takes time to remove the logs from her own eyes so she can see clearly to take the twigs out of others. She takes off her own rags of the demonic thoughts, the demonic words. She gets revelation to that. So she can actually get wisdom. That woman gets wisdom. And she can build her house, the house of the Most High, the royal priesthood. She's, you know, Esther didn't come before the king whining and complaining, but in a spirit of love and faith for the cause of the king and the cause of the kingdom. Because she was living to, to please the king of heaven, not herself. She wasn't her greater cause. That's a huge problem, too, because the woman whose heart is bands and snares and traps is really the woman that's, that's living to please herself, right? So there's a scripture that says, A woman shall be satisfied by the fruit of her own mouth. Slothful women lie to themselves when their words grieve them. They don't mind feeding on ashes all day long. Like the scripture says, they feed on ashes all day long. A deceived heart has turned them aside that they can't say there's a light in their right hand. So they'll give ashes to others to eat too, murmur and complain, right? So a wise woman gets her food from afar, that third heaven. And the foolish don't mind eating and drinking all kinds of junk food from the first earthly, sensual, devilish wisdom. 
those dark spirits. He talks about getting drunk on the cup of devils. That's what it means. The, uh, and so out of the abundance of our heart, whatever we're going to meditate on, our mouth speaks. And when, when women don't really want to go after the issues of life that come from the heart, your life gets spent in vanity. You talk nothing burgers, you think nothing burgers. You're on the run from understanding your heart and you keep everybody from understanding your heart too. So um, a woman shall be satisfied. We're satisfied when we speak the right thing because we have wisdom, wisdom from above, right? So let's see here. Sorry, I'm looking at my notes here. Our mouth shows the true communion of our soul, whether we're communing in earthly, sensual, devilish wisdom, or we're communing with the revelator, the Jesus who came with God's government on his shoulders to help us see what we can't see and hear what we don't hear. Jesus helps you see past words and past what's here. He helps you. He came with the government of, on his shoulders to help us see what we don't see, spirits, and help us hear what we don't hear. The difference between the devil's voice and God's voice, right? That's why we need Jesus. So, let's see here. It's the Lord who gives wisdom. Out of his mouth comes understanding. He stores up hope for the upright. So, when you're hopeless, what is that indicative of? that you're not getting gold in the fire in your life. He's not storing up hope for the foolish woman because she doesn't get gold tried in the fire. All of her trials don't turn into gold. And there's such a great scripture about that too. And I really want to rewrite a song. Out of their belly shall flow rivers of living waters. I even knew a song when I was young, a Christian. It goes, Therefore, with joy shall we draw water out of the wells of salvation. You know, what matters is that today we hide his word in our heart about the issues of life that come from the heart. So we have a gold mine. So our heart becomes a well of wisdom that other people can draw from. Because today I heard God's voice and I hid that word in my heart so I wouldn't sin against him. I don't have to memorize scriptures because I remember the scripture that was the bread of life for me today. That's what really matters too. There's a lot of people in denominations spend their life studying the Bible, memorizing the Bible, but there's no practical application to their life. So do you think it's real? It's not what they're handling and tasting and touching of the word of life today to hear his voice. So, um, he stores up hope for the upright and those that walk without blemish. When we want to please God, we're going to get wisdom from the third heaven, not the first and second heaven. So it depends on how sincere we are, really, and how much we really want to please God. So can Jesus trust in your heart? The heart of her husband does safely trust in her that he has no need of spoil because she's living for the greater cause. This is, again, Proverbs 31. It says she gets her food supplies. She uh, looks to cover the naked. She looks to feed the hungry. Maybe that's all really deep spiritually, more than even carnally, because it says her merchandise is, is gold and silver. It's, it comes from the heavens above, God's wisdom. You know, that's the business I want to be in, is God's business to save and keep souls, to save and keep my soul so I can help save and keep other people's souls. So it's the difference from being a beggarly woman who's begging all your life or being a wise woman who's building your house. So the beggarly women of the world who can never get enough use spirits to do their bidding for them to get their needs met. They whine, they complain to each other, they build up the spirit of pity in each other, they don't mind handing out the dish of poison. It's a ploy to use others. You know, a lot of people are trying to have a place to be important. We all need to be loved, but you can use the wrong spirit to get love instead of being a wise woman to put yourself forth to try to get your needs met. It's, it's demonic, so... 
I was talking today about how desperately lonely I was as a child. And when I was five years old, I went and ate dust behind a door because I was hoping my mom would stay home and be with me. I could be sick and I could have my mom because I never had her. And um, I used to think the only time I could get her and a little bit of her is when I got sick. And so I was talking to a couple friends of mine how I could have just curled up and got died and got cancer and bitterness a couple times in my life where I had really drastic things going on. I mean, most people won't be on the run from a serial murder and rapist. And most people won't have a mother's husband who was one of the most vile men who might as well have been a serial murder and rapist. He was that bad off. And then to have two of them in my world at once and what and my, my mother's husband hired a serial mother and murder rapist. I'm not talking about Gene Sullivan. I was married to this guy for about five years, had four kids with him real fast. And if you want to look up that story, it's called Yellowstone Women's Valley Magazine on YouTube. You can find it under CeCe Sullivan. I don't really want to divert to that, but there's a couple times I felt so out of control, so bitter, maybe even like three times I can remember in my life that I thought I was going to die of bitterness, feeling like man's victim, feeling like God's victim. I mean, I went next door to a priest and told him actually to put me in a mental institution. I told my mother that too, because I didn't have a sound mind. I was going through the valley of the shadow of death, fearing everything. And women curl up and die under that. Or they, they, you know, there's all kinds of horrible things that happen when women don't know what to do with their fear and they're acting out their fear on other people and unbelief. That's why it's called the great transgression. The fearful and the unbelieving will be the first to be cast into hell. I told the Lord one time, I'm first on the list. And you know, Jesus promises to heal us from our fear and unbelief. All we have to do is admit it tell the Lord the truth, and then look for his truth. Way too hard for religious people that are being good. They study the Bible hours and hours and never get anything out of it because they won't own their fear, they won't own their unbelief, and they don't look to hear from God about the issues of life that come from the heart. So you can study the Bible and go to every Bible college and master every Bible study there is in the world and not get anywhere. Because you're not being honest with God and you're not talk, letting him talk to you specifically about the issues of life in your heart. That's true Christianity, by the way. My sheep hear my voice and they follow it. In, re, in, real, in reality, real time, with real situations, with real problems, we hear the voice of the shepherd. That's who Gene Sullivan is. So forget a movie is going to be made about his life. I mean, what matters the most is that he taps into the third dimension of heaven and tries to act out God's wisdom in people's life. And man, it's the only reason I could actually see and understand these things myself. And what is so cool is having all the women in my life that I've known for years kind of come out from behind the bushes of their own opinions and the wisdom of their own conceit and actually decide that maybe God put an older woman in their life to teach a younger woman how to love. If we don't have that, if we, you know, if we're walking in the light of our own sparks, the wisdom of our own conceit, if we have nobody in our life, that means we're rebellious because God puts people in families. And it's only through the pressure and force of conflict, offenses, that bring up our selfishness. It's kind of like being raised in a single family as an only child. Those people don't get converted. They stay selfish. Conversion can happen with these four little adorable sons I have, these three little adorable children I have, especially with a daughter and a son who really get the operation of God in conflict, can teach their children actually how to buy gold in their trials with each other, maybe take a look at the log in their eye so they can see clearly to be their brother's keeper and helper instead of their brother's slayer. Yeah, it's exciting. And, and more women in my life are actually understanding these deep truths. And it is so cool because I've been married to Jean for 37 years. I think we're going on 38 years. 
we've traveled through life with a lot of women that were bitter, critical, fault-finding teenagers, or they've been little three-year-olds that act and think and speak like a child and don't care. Don't care who they take down in the world of acting, thinking, and speaking like a child and haven't cared who they take down and being a teenager that's just judging everybody and bitter and critical fault finders and man, they can judge all things, right? But they don't have faith and hope and love and they don't have a testimony and they haven't been reconciled to God themselves. So next time you get upset, ask yourself if you have done the same infraction that you're damning somebody else for so your soul doesn't get snared. And you know, this is that's what's so cool is how being pressurized by women. I was sorry for my sin. But when I saw the log in their eye with the women that came into my life, I never got close to my own sisters, but in the kingdom of God, who are your fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, those that do God's will, I started getting close to those women and cracking out my open my Bible to see what God had to say about their problems gave me a testimony. It reconciled me to God. I fellowship the Lord's suffering and what I was suffering in people and understood his suffering that he suffered in my sin. It's the magic most people will never get, never understand, nor will they ever do. Everybody wants God's glory. Everybody wants that sweet little Jesus that just tickles their emotions and makes them feel good. Most people don't really want to understand the log in their own eye to take the twig out of somebody else's eye. Most people don't even want to understand the depth of Jesus' reconciliation to them so they can have the ministry of reconciliation to others. This is where bitterness is such a tragic thing. And man, I could make this a lot longer talking about really, really hard trials in my life. I had two of them where I felt like I was being murdered and raped. And I felt so out of control. And I learned to put my trust in the Lord and not lean on my own understanding. And man, I'd love to share those stories. If you're watching this tape and you want to hear those stories and you want me to spend time with you, I'd be happy to tell you how I passed through the valley of the shadow of death, fearing everything. But the Lord became my shepherd and I ended up in green grass. And it's really cool in Jeremiah 17. It says, when you get out from under that curse, because you put your trust in man, you stop sitting on dead eggs. This is Jeremiah 17. You stop being a traveling desert with no food, no water. And you become like a watered garden where your fruit never fails. <laughs> The wisdom of God is so superior to any wealth of the earth. And uh, wow. So back to the beggarly women of the earth, the slothful, the void of understanding, that don't feed God's sheep a crumb because they don't really love God and they don't hear from the good shepherd. And they don't, you know, Jesus said, if you love me, feed my sheep. Women that are desolate, slothful beggars cannot feed anybody with understanding. So the beggarly women of the world who don't ever get enough, it says hell and destruction is never full. Once you tap into that first and second heaven, you have to just belly, belly, belly up to the bar and look for worldly fullness because you're avoiding the issues of life that come from the heart. God help you if you're my granddaughter or my daughter-in-law or my granddaughter-in-law watching this. I'm begging you to not check out of the issues of life in the heart and lust after the world because the earth will eventually swallow you up if you do that. That's where it takes people in the end. So, And when you don't want God's wisdom, all you can do is look for happiness and vanity. And man, you can never get enough and it's fleeting. So those women, they whine and complain to each other. They pity, pity, pity. Oh, poor you. Oh, poor me. They complain and the earth is swallowing them up and they don't get it. And they don't mind what they're doing really because it's making them feel good and important. But it's a ploy to elevate man's wisdom. It's a ploy to elevate self-life, self-wisdom. And let me just get 
one thing straight right now, nothing I have came from me. It all came from God or people I know. It came through spiritual impartation of what's good. Every perfect gift comes from God, the Father of lights. So who you see now is not the woman that weighed about 40 pounds less that was losing the color in her eyes that looked like a dead woman walking when I was about 25. I looked like death walking then. So I was a beggarly woman looking for anybody to fix me, help me, and save me, but Jesus Christ. So the wise woman is considering what seeds she's sowing. You know, he gives seed to the sower. Once you care about what you're really sowing into people's hearts and lives, you like you really care, like in the face of God, he's going to give you his seed. And if you're content to just bury the gift of God in you, you'll just end up, uh, what does it say about the gift? When you bury the gift, the gift of the talent. Weepers and the gnashers of the earth. Gnash, gnash, gnash on people. Gnash on politics. Gnash, gnash, gnash. Bitter, critical. We can just gnash on anything and everything and be bitter. You know, it says they, and weep, weep, weep over what's happening politically. Weep, weep, weep over the world. You know, should we be sad? Yeah, but you know, God's got it all under control. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And a lot of darkness has got to play out. That's in the Bible too. Read Matthew 24. The, the drill for us in Matthew 20, uh, Matthew 24 and Matthew 21, Luke 21, it talks about to not let our hearts be over, are overcharged by drunkenness, surfeiting the cares of this life so the day it comes upon us unaware. I don't want to be in a drunken stupor when Jesus comes back, so... I try to help other women wake up to that fact, too. So uh, a wise woman is considering what she's sowing out of the spirit of her mouth into the hearts, the dirt of other people's souls. And the truth is, when you're talking to somebody that has a desert heart or hearts that are rock or hard ground, don't waste too much time with those people because the seeds aren't going anywhere. The birds will come get them and they fly away or the, the winds blow them off. Speak to a wise woman, a wise man, and they'll be yet wiser. Speak in the ears of a fool that doesn't want to make judgments, that doesn't really care. It's kind of a waste of time. Uh, Derek Prince puts it this way. Don't give yourself to people who aren't desperate. Because when you're not desperate, you know, just like the song says, I'm desperate for you. I'm lost without you. You're the air I breathe. You're the very essence of life. Until somebody gets there, wow, don't waste a lot of time on hard hearts. Don't waste a lot of time on rocky hearts. And don't waste a lot of time on desert hearts because until somebody's got good ground, the seed's not going to stick. And you know what is so cool again? <laughs> I, I don't know how many friends. I can't count them. But through the course of time, I got some good ground hearted friends and man it is cool because we are throwing seeds of life at each other it's a continual feast one of the scriptures says it calls it this that there's the finest of wheat i would have given you the finest of wheat i think it's isaiah 31 and my gosh it, there's another scripture that says the wise in heart have a continual feast the dimension of spiritual activity i live in now with some women is so cool, so powerful, so anointed. Because I got good ground, they got good ground. We are throwing some meaty seeds at each other. And it is one of the most exciting things that's ever happened to me in my life. <laughs> I got some wise women in my life that actually care about the meditation of their heart now and the words that are coming out of their mouth, the spirit. And they can even taste them. And they're being able to see past what people see hear past what people hear, see dimensionally into the to the third heaven and where they you can get God's wisdom. And who can believe a woman that's worked with Mel Gibson, Jim Caviezel, all the big names. I mean, looking at all the big names, this lady that, that wrote the screenplay about Jean, for her to be able to perceive one thing about Jean's life, that the guy hears from God in difficult situations. He cares about God's voice because that's really what matters. 
It's the only thing that matters. And for her to see that, okay, Mr. Strong Man, huge husky, could have taken some men on in difficult situations that didn't, even these big, huge men did not know that Gene Sullivan was a heavyweight boxing champion. He could have punched their lights out and maybe killed them physically. But instead of acting out as a carnal man, he got God's wisdom. And that's what matters. That's what makes you famous in God's kingdom, not having a movie made about you. It's what you do to the least. It's how you, it's what, what, what source you tap into every day, today if you hear his voice. It's, it's how we treat the least is what we do unto Jesus and what we do unto Jesus and us. So people are murdering their own soul every day by the nothing burgers that come out of their mouth and the nothing burgers they feed others or just rank burgers, poisonous burgers. Out of our own mouth comes our destruction. That is how a foolish woman plucks her house down with her own hands. So the wise woman considers what she sows. She considers where she gets her seeds, where she plants them. She exercises her body, mind, spirit, and soul and doesn't use circumstances and situations to check out a life. Her lamp doesn't go out. Her spiritual discernment doesn't go out. She doesn't stop making judgments spiritually. The spiritual man judges all things, tests the spirits. Yeah, we should be living that way. So her clothes, those the wisdom from God she gets over and over and over and hides in her heart becomes the threads she can sew clothes with on others. It's the food she can cook up for and feed other people. Nobody starves on her watch. Her children get clothed. So she's not always demanding for everybody to fix her and save her and help her. So our very works, deep, deep scripture and revelation, that the very thoughts that come from God that I act on and obey are my clothes. It talks about that in the book of Revelation, that the righteous acts of the saints are the people. Who are these people? Where did they come from? They're all dressed in white, linen so bright. You read that scripture and it's about those little thoughts that Jesus put in my head. Pick up the phone and call her and say this. Do this, do that, go here, go there. Those are the clothes we're gonna be wearing. And even this is powerful, Malachi 3. Those that feared the Lord, that had good ground, that got good seeds, spoke often to one another. A book of remembrance, a movie was being made about them. They'll be my jewels when I make up my jewels. You know, that's deep. Malachi 3 is very deep. you got to go for the soap. God's a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. you got to understand that, too, to be part of the ones that are fearing the Lord and speaking the truth. So, um, let's see. She is not afraid. She gets spiritual wealth from God. She dispenses it wisely. Strength and honor are her clothes. She's thrown away the rags of fear and unbelief. She opens her mouth with wisdom, not whining, not fretting. And, oh, I'm afraid. Oh, unbelief. Please fix me. Save me. Help me. Can you be Jesus for me, please? So upon her tongue is the law of kindness, not hopelessness, not depression. Because he gives hope to the upright. He speaks words to those that have a right spirit. So hopelessness is just kind of a symptom of slothfulness, right? Just depression is also another symptom of the cold you have called slothfulness, spiritual slothfulness. So um, she deals with things in her integrity. And there's a great scripture about that too. The integrity of the upright shall guide them. Because she really wants nothing she thinks and says and does to bring a reproach upon the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In uh, Psalm 45, it says this, she doesn't obey the demons that mommy obeyed, daddy obeyed. She doesn't serve the devils that mom and dad served that took mom and dad down. She makes obedience to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords instead. So, uh, I wanted to say this because my son and I are, are making a song professionally. And he wrote this song a long time ago about the movie of your life. Because again, we're all in a movie. 
we're all playing that movie out every single day. The book is being written, so the script. And what is the music in our soul? Because it doesn't matter really what either what we say. If I'm whining, fretting, despairing, hopeless, that's why when I was 25, I looked like a dead woman walking because I had the music of hell in me. I even read a proverb because I was reading my Bible back then. <laughs> I read this proverb that says they don't have any life in their bones. <laughs> it was a proverb. So I'm later, an hour later in my car, looking at my color of my eyes decreasing, saying, oh my God, oh my God, I'm dying. I'm, I'm that proverb, the, the dead walking, aren't I, Lord? That's, that's me. Oh, they have no life in their bones. I think that actually is happening to me. It was because I wasn't storing up wisdom in my soul. So there is a battle of the flesh and the spirit, the battle between the first and second heaven and the third heaven. And the wisdom of God who sits on the throne is in the third heaven. And he's very near to us and wants to speak to us. And it's so much easier having a relationship with Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit than with demons. Again, I have a lot to say about that because I've been in dark places. So here's the song my son wrote, which you're going to be hearing the professional version. I'm going to end it with this. If they made a movie about my life, would the soundtrack be nice and jolly or mostly filled with melancholy? When the melody comes in soft to set the scene, will it finally tell the reason why there's a constant sparkle in my eye? Or will this drown soundtrack underscore the fact that I could not ask for more? Action! yelled out loud across the stage. And the characters are unsuspecting. The one who's always been directing. And after all the drama has been played out, will the music swell in between the hero's death and the banquet scene? And the conductor draws cue. And stroke by stroke, it's all because of you. You put a new song in my heart, even praise to my God. That's what I consider. He put a new song in my heart, even praise to God. And it just about killed my children and myself when I was singing the blues with the devil. So he put this song in my heart. That's why I'm singing. It's a beautiful day. Hey, I'll always adore you. It's only for you that the music will play. And I'll follow every note in time because you're the soundtrack of my life. The curtain will fall for all of us someday. But before I finally take my bow, I dream to sing to you somehow. But the chorus of my song does not compare. Your timeless symphony was love. And it resonated because of you. Drinking out of the wellspring of worldly wisdom and demonic wisdom. And all those wise in their own conceit, wise people in their head but fools in the wisdom of the issues of life from the heart. One of my friends sent this proverb today, and I'm just going to read it. I, the first part of it's pretty profound, too. It really is an expose on spiritual whoredom. We all understand what physical whoredom is. It's hard to see as murmuring and complaining and fretting and whining and bitching and moaning and bitterness as spiritual whoredom, fear and unbelief. But it's kind of what, why God told Hosea to go marry a whore. And maybe it was a lot more spiritual than it was even physical. Because if you look up spiritual whoredom in the Bible, you'll understand a lot. I never even understood it until I heard a man get up on a stage whose testimony is on our page. If you look at the, the do a search for the guy lost at sea, Rick Ramsbottom, my gosh, he gets up and shares this story because he was wealthy, had a house on the beach, drugs, Lamborghini, all of it. And he got caught in the ocean. It's a great story. But he started talking about, Lord, I, I love to do what you hate and I hate to do what you love. Please help me to love what you love. I'm telling you, after all the psychology and counseling I had, I could not believe it was that simple. It was that simple. 
it's just so the Lord the truth. I love something I shouldn't love. I think there's something wrong with my love. And I think you can help me with my love because you're the God of love. And when I'm deficient in love, you can help me love and not be afraid. And you know what? It was so profound. It changed my life. I got I started getting out of my heart, my spiritual heart. And you know, every time I get afraid and every time I do what love doesn't dictate, I'm just asking the Lord, give me a little bit more love because it's all a crime against love, right? Every dark thing is just a crime against love. So back to Proverbs 5. Now I explained 1 through 7. Now I'm going to talk about 7. Now then, my sons, my daughters, listen to me. Don't turn aside from what I say. Keep your path far from those demonic voices. Don't go near the door of, the, of those, all those demons' houses because you give your honor to others, dark spirits. You give your dignity to somebody who's cruel, the father of lies. Strangers, those dark spirits will feast on your wealth, the wealth of your very being. And I can say that because it's happened to me. And you'll spend all your substance, all your toil in the wrong house, some demonic spirit's house. And you know, again, I've done it. Please spend time with me if you want to. I'll tell you all about it. You'll groan at the last when your flesh and body are consumed and you'll say how I hated discipline. I didn't like instruction. My heart spurned and rejected correction. I wouldn't obey my teachers or turn my ear to my instructors. And I was soon in very serious trouble in dark places. Drink water out of your own cistern. Drink from the fountain of living water. Drink from the bread of life. Jesus wants to speak to you about the issues of life that come from the heart today. Today, if you hear his voice, give us this bread, our daily bread. Deliver us from the great evil of being offended, unforgiving, and ticked off at man and God. Deliver us from that great evil, Lord. Help us out so we won't be unforgiving towards people. And we won't be blaming you for what people do that suck because we'll understand our own flesh and spirit battle. And God, I pray that this would bless you and help you. Watch it many times. Watch it over and over. Pause it. Come back to it. This is the mes message of life. And if you knew the terrible pit I got delivered from, you'd see how much wisdom that came from God came out of my mouth in 47 minutes. Amen.